We've got a team we, that that's just the kind of stuff that we enjoy doing. Um, and we, myself and Sean here, kind of built this group, Opportunity Investors, from a somewhat selfish point of view. We like talking about real estate and beer. And we like learning about it. So we bring in lots of people and, and we uh, like beer. We decided to set this two years ago. Almost and, um, four now, right, Ashley? Is it four? Yeah, it'll be four years in October. Yeah. 
Yeah, so yeah, so almost four years this thing's been going on, so it's crazy. Awesome. I don't know. <laughs> um, but basically, we like talking real estate, we're drinking beer, so we're here, and uh, we're glad you guys could join us. And um, if you have not been here, you're here for the first time. Nice. Awesome. Yeah, Heck yeah, man. Yeah. That's great. Very cool. So, um, opportunity investors, it's about real estate investing strategies, financing options, the implementation of those right here in Hampton Roads and beyond. Um, we bring in industry experts, uh, professionals who talk on subjects that are hopefully relevant to the people in this room. Um, and right here, right now, kind of stuff. The last element to this group is networking. And we are grateful to be able to bring that part of, of opportunity back. So, you know, we, we just started coming back. And this is the first event where we've kind of gotten back to the old, the old ways. For sure. Super excited about that. But the reality is, in real estate, you can't do it all yourself. You've got to have good people around you. Whether it's a money guy, whether it's an agent, whether it's a wholesaler, someone finding deals, whether it's whatever it is, you can't do it all yourself. You gotta put good people around you. And this is a great place to find some good people to do that. So networking is key. So without any further ado, let's get this thing rolling. Let's learn, let's network, and let's raise our glasses for a quick toast. May your castle be secure and your cup overflowing. How many of you guys had followed us through the pandemic when we were doing online? A few. Awesome. Awesome. So we do broadcast this live. Um, and this is like a whole new world for us doing all this. As you can tell, it's like high tech equipment and stuff figured out. So um, we really appreciate you joining us and we really appreciate you following us, right? Like Alex said, we started this three or four years ago, and it all started from like, hey, you want to grab a beer and talk shop? And that's literally what this is, right? That's how this came about. And that's how we want to keep this group. We want it to be a very, uh, I guess the corny word is organic, um, but we want it to just be like, we know people locally. We, were, we wanted to have people that weren't coming from out of town. They were trying to pitch you some program, right? Like come in, learn, and then ex like execute, okay? So for those that don't know, my name is Sean Bowen. I'm the owner of Full Circle Investment Group. Our niche is wholesaling. We are very good at marketing, right? We're very good at finding deals, getting those deals under contract and selling that paper. How many people are familiar with that model? A lot, cool. So you've probably heard of us, you've probably seen us all over the place doing that. Um, and if you haven't, uh, go sign up. If you're a buyer, go check us out at vaoffmarketdeals.com. Um, otherwise, we're really stoked to have you guys here and really looking forward to having Gary and Matt talk about their almost identical models with a little bit of different twist, right? And I think that's what you're gonna hear a difference in tonight. So it's not about us, it's about them. And um, which one wants to go first? Yeah. Yeah? Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. let's do it. <laughs> oh, cool. Thanks, guys. Um, my name is Kerry Copenhaver. I'm a local real estate investor. I'm a real estate agent, landlord, short term rental, rental properties. So I do a little bit of everything. And when they said that we had similar models, but different models, like I'm, you know, I'm that guy that feels like I can do everything. And so that's what I do. I'm a dog in my own machinery, which is not always the best way to operate. And we can dig a little deeper into that one. So. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my specific short term rentals. I have um, mine are Virginia Beach. I've had six. I've sold two. I'm still operating. Uh, well, actually, I have seven. I'm still operating three, and I'm going to sell another one, and I'll explain why. My mic is muted. Can you hear me now? Is that better? How about that? All right, is that better? Because if I need to yell, I have kids, I know how to do that. So, yeah, so we'll talk about little, like, I'm a way smaller scale than what Matt's doing. And, uh, but we're all here to learn from each other. This dude is brilliant. I was very happy to meet him and just get his feedback on a lot of different items in this particular arena. And uh, I'll pass the 
Floor to you, my friend. To hey everybody, I'm Matt Fisher. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree and think that like Carrie and I, Carrie and I both kind of like understand a lot of the intricate details um, of the short-term rental market. And I always love chatting with Carrie about like what's going on and how to go from, as Carrie mentioned, I'm more on the scale side. So short version, I run a small private equity firm. We're focused on both buying multifamily um, into single family homes, fully renovating, converting to short term rentals. We've got about 150 today in Hampton Roads, primarily Norfolk, Virginia Beach, and uh, raise money from private investors and build that out. Um, also run a construction company, uh, property management company, and then a couple other like real estate and tech related firms. And so I think the really cool thing is, is that um, started it from one, you know, uh, Airbnb rental mm -hmm. and then kind of went from there. And so I think uh, scale, you know, you hear about the Saunders and I'll m mention a couple of the bigger players a little bit tonight. You look at those folks that I think are doing a lot of things right, but they're doing massive scale, but don't understand it, not to toot our own horns, but like don't understand it from first principles of making it work on one short term rental. And so I think what Carrie and I hope to do today is Carrie's data is going to be mine hands down on the one to five, which is where mm -hmm. most I think folks in this room are thinking about getting started. How do you do that? If you don't do that well, you can't scale beyond that, even if you have aspirations to do so. So I think that'll be some of the balances. Mm -hmm. Carrie ta talking about how do you actually make it work from kind of do doing the zero to one, and then yep. I can talk a lot about the scaling side. Um, Carrie knows way more about the ins and outs of the Virginia Beach kind of regulatory environment. I'm deeper in Norfolk and mm -hmm. know some in Virginia Beach, but uh, I think a precursor is that I think if any of you guys are interested in getting into it, you can rely on folks like Carrie or myself to kind of provide guidance about what works and what doesn't. Uh, but it's definitely serious business in almost any municipality that you're working in. And so definitely take the ownership of understanding regs really, 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 really well. Um, that's probably the number one thing that if, if you don't understand that well and kind of take ownership for it. I've seen a, a lot of folks who will ask us, what should I do? I just bought this thing or I'm under contract. Can I short term rent it? And a lot, like 50% of the calls we've gotten in the last three weeks is, no, you can't. Sorry that you just bought that. Um, so got to take ownership of yourself. We can provide some mm -hmm. guidance, but that's kind of the first takeaway. Thousand percent. Before you buy, before you buy, and it's honestly, it is not very difficult to look up a city ordinance. Just put Virginia Beach short-term rental regulations, Norfolk short STR regulations, and it they'll they are they've done an excellent job as of late in order to point you into the direction that you need in order to be able to fulfill that. So any if you intend on purchasing, or you have a client that intends on purchasing for the purposes of using it as short-term rental. It needs to be contingent upon their ability to get a conditional use permit because you're going to need that in our particular area with a few exceptions. Um, my understanding is that Chesapeake is still illegal, it's right? Still illegal. Okay, yeah. so if you are not zoned a bed and breakfast in Chesapeake, you cannot operate a short-term rental, okay? Legally, I should say that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Portsmouth, to my understanding, Portsmouth doesn't really have any regulations, but it's Portsmouth, and if you don't know Portsmouth, it's Portsmouth. So they're usually a little, I mean, it's, it's just, uh, I will tell you that they're far more tenant friendly than they are landlord friendly. Um, there's a bureaucracy a mile deep there. They're very slow to move on things. So I would say that you're taking your, you know, you're, you're, you're risking everything by moving into Portsmouth. I know some people that have short-term rentals in Portsmouth. I'm just saying, proceed with caution on that one. Hampton, do you know anything about Hampton? Hampton, I, I think it's well, not identical to Portsmouth, but they are early days pre-reg. So I think if you call up Chesapeake, to your point, they don't have regulations, but they interpret that, uh, their city uh, planning, they interpret the fact that they don't have regulations as it being right. illegal, whereas Portsmouth, Hampton, they'll say we don't have regulations, but it's allowable. Here's how you would remit tax, which that's, uh, we'll asterisk that. It's a question mark of how you do that well. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, I got a summons in the mail six months ago. Everything started out pretty good. And now it's just 
been dead in the water for like three months. Yeah. I mean, Welcome to there. bureaucracy. This is what it looks like. <laughs> so yeah, so I was like, yeah, let's take a specific yeah. example. Uh, how many units? At the, is it a, one, how many bedrooms? Yeah. Five, so it's a conditional use permit, yes. right? So you, uh, you submitted your conditional use permit application. That's, I've submitted everything and I haven't heard anything for like, yeah. it my civically. Yep. The last thing, last communication I had with them was I got my letter from them building. Okay. For the, for the cop. Yep. You know, all that. Sent it in. Called. Well, we don't know where your paperwork's at. So I drove down here from Pittsburgh to try and walk it in there. But yeah. You can't walk it in there because all the doors yeah. are locked. <laughs> So, yes, I, mean, I know. I'm looking for advice. <laughs> yeah, in, in, in the spirit, we'll circle yeah. back around yeah. to that. Like Same after point. this meeting, we'll circle yeah. back around to that. But but let me back up for a second and and have you guys understand that written into our residential code by default is you cannot rent for less than 30 days. Like that is just like if you're R5D or R7S or whatever your single family residence or duplex zoning is already written into the code is like you can't have chickens. You can't have cows and you can't rent for less than 30 days. So that's why all this conditional use permit, because a lot of people are like, my property rights, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, but you're R5D or whatever. And it's already written into the code that you cannot rent for less than 30 days. It's already there. You can't run certain businesses. You can't have certain livestock. You can't use it for our, you know, agriculture. So that's why we're in a stage where you know, you have these industry disruptors. You have Lyft, you have Uber, and then you have Airbnb. And Airbnb made accessible this platform to property owners where before it was just like the North End working with property managers and doing vacation rentals, high-end, rich people, blah, blah, blah. And then you get this industry disruptor and everybody's like, I'm going to Airbnb. And it, it just overwhelmed the system. It overwhelmed the neighborhoods. There are a lot of bad hosts out there that don't care. They're just trying to turn a buck. They don't care if there's a party, whatever. Then you also have the, the um, and I forgive me if I offend anybody, the Karens of the world who have nothing better to do but to turn around and complain. I know this because I'm, you know, live down the street from one. And she's focused on us for whatever reason. I'm not even, I mean, this is just my personal home, but, you know, she, that's all she does is, like, calls in violations. There are none, but just... Because, like, I don't think she has anything else to focus her time on. So that's why we're in a space where we have to do conditional use permits and the short-term rentals. So what happened in Virginia Beach is we're all, like, property rights owners and vacation rentals. down, And they had them down on the north end for the longest time. And they were zoned no more than 30 days, right? No less than 30 days. And they're doing it, so everybody else starts to do it. Well, then you have the civic leagues and everybody, and they're like, what do we do? So the city started this whole ordinance program, and then, and I'm going to dive deep into that in a minute. But right now we're just talking about the business model of short-term rentals. Um, and, and I want to talk a little bit about, let's see, so the next one would be, you know, what is a short-term rental? So basically that is providing a stay for less than 30 days, all right? So if you're an annual rental, then you, you have established tenancy that's falling under a, a Landlord-Tenant Act that's in Virginia, if you have more than four units, you're subjected to that. So when you have these shorter stays, it gives you the opportunity for higher cash flow because now you're doing it by the day versus by the month, right? You, these shorter stays, in my opinion, shorter stays, they're easier on my space, right? You have a tenant that moves in for a couple years. There might be some deferred maintenance. They might forget to tell you that the toilet's leaking. They might forget to tell you that your soffit's, you know, open, whatever. And so when these guests are coming in for these shorter stays, they're in and out, you're in and out, you get to stay on top of your property a little bit more. Um, you don't really have evictions. We'll circle back around to that because sometimes you do have evictions, but that's a different conversation. So, um, But tenancy and short-term rentals is established after 90 days. So if you have been utilizing that property as a short-term rental, it has always been a short-term rental, it is established as short-term rental, then you can self-evict. You're not subjected to the same landlord-tenant acts that regular landlords are. And so I have specific language in my short-term leases because one of the other things I'm going to talk to you guys about are furnished rentals, which is a more than 30-day but less than 90-day. And it also has a benefit to it. And it's how I keep my places, how I kept them full in COVID, how I kept them full in the wintertime because I'm kind of seasonal. Um, especially because COVID took out a lot of the events that I had coming into my spaces, which were, you know, corporate training events. We have 
cheerleading competitions, wrestling matches, things that happened. I'm down at the oceanfront, so anything that happened at the convention center was on hold last year. Um, luckily, it panned out for us because while that was happening, all that got canceled, all your guests are canceling, but then you also had all these people that were displaced because they had sold their homes and then they their, their moves got canceled because they're military and they didn't have anywhere to go. So it was really a... a um, I don't, I don't know how to, how to articulate this, but it just, everything kind of comes together and it pans out. It just, you just have to be out there moving that, you know, I, I told my husband after this, I'll be a professional, I should be a professional chess player because of the maneuvering. And I can't, I was thinking about you all last year because I'm like, I have six. Matt has a lot. <laughs> like, how did you do last year? Yeah, so I, I'm glad you mentioned that. One of, one of the things that I think is, really beautiful about this model and kind of a thesis we had even before COVID is it's a pain in the neck for all of us. Like I've rented for 10 years, actually. I just bought my first normal house. Um, it was kind of delayed after investment stuff. But um, it's kind of a pain, right? Especially like younger, I would say younger generation that are buying stuff later, right? They're renting things longer. Um, the old model, at least this is my thesis, old model of starting your lease at the first of the month, going a year, having to go buy all your furniture, yada, 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 kind of a pain. Like, it's a pain for everybody, but I think now we have a lot of the technology that, and operations that enable us to ask the question, why is that the case? And so, pre-COVID, we were super blessed in that we were thinking and building those ops to, to enable a lease, or we were calling it like a flexible duration rental, like a one to 89 day stay, they could start at any day of the month. Really, that's like an Airbnb, how that works. So. We got into February, we started looking at, you know, like early Feb, looking at uh, um, potential impact of COVID. Long, long story short, what we ended up doing is the winter, much like Carrie's model, we are primarily these 30 to 89 days days. A lot of travel nurses, a lot of uh, military, mm -hmm. visiting professors, et cetera. And we block off our units to allow that because if anybody here is an Airbnb host, you know that if you just leave your calendar open in the winter, you get what I call like buck tooth bookings. Like people will just like fill up your calendar and then you can't have these longer stays. And so your occupancy is gonna be like 40, 50% in the off season. Mm -hmm. So we said, okay, let's, we've been, our model, probably much like Carrie's, is let's block off our calendar, minimum of 30 day stay, we're gonna source it through Furnish Finder, a bunch of other yep. sources. So we got to February during COVID, I think we were like 90% occupied in February, our entire summer got canceled, much like most Airbnb hosts, and we just said, hey, look, let's leave the summer block for 30 plus day stays. Um, and so we kind of modulated that. It felt like mm -hmm. every single day, much like yourself, we were changing the model and saying, okay, we've got Moving 20 more Moving the pieces around the board. Even travel nurses, we've got 20 more travel nurses. Let's plug them all in. And the travel yeah. nurses are calling saying, hospitals are under capacity. Like my, my contract's getting canceled. So, okay, what do we do there? We were meanwhile getting calls from folks in New York and Pittsburgh and wherever mm -hmm. wanting to get out of Dodge and come down. So I remember I was coaching our reservationist through the like, we have 20 people from New York call today to, to try to book a place. And so it's the flexibility, I think, in summary, the flexibility of the model mm -hmm. that Carrie and I utilize that is really, really powerful if you stay on top of it. So the point to that too is the demand is there. So to your point, I found that fascinating too because I had people that were like, because now we're working remotely. So then they were like, I don't have to be here. Where can I go? And they would come down south. So we were able to fill our spots, same thing, with people that were just like trying to get out of certain urban areas or just move out of the north or whatever to be in a, a more temperate climate. And so there, there is that demand and the flexibility is a huge uh, piece of the success puzzle on this one. So, all right, let's see what's the next slide is. All right, so we're, now we're gonna dive into the type of short-term rentals because again, this does matter when it comes to regulations. So a whole house rental is what I'm doing, like my townhouses, that they're whole house rentals. Um, a home sharing is where you, it is your principal residence, you live in the property, and you home share a room or an attached piece of your house. It cannot be an accessory building is not illegal. In Virginia Beach specifically, you cannot legally rent an accessory building. So if you have a detached garage or the department, that's, that would be considered illegal, um, but you can rent any portion of your house. And so um, house hacking was brought up by Alex earlier. So I have a, have a buddy, I was telling Heather and Alan about, they're laughing too. He's looking at buying a house in Croatan. 
he's going to live in the downstairs unit and then <laughs> home share the upstairs, which is a brilliant strategy because he'll cash flow the hell out of that and be able to pay down that mortgage a lot sooner. I mean, I'd probably buy a multifamily, but, you know, that's just me. <laughs> so um, you can also do unique places like uh, whatever trailers. Uh, there are RVs. There's a lady around here that did glamping, so she would go set up a tent at one of the, um, like, the Travel L Park. She also had a boat at a marina. So you're not limited. They're also like the level of creativity here is unlimited as long as the city regulations are met. Then you, you're free to do whatever. I mean, so, you can't do this here, but in other areas you can, you can rent out space in your yard and throw up a tent. And, you know, how this whole Airbnb thing started was the founders of Airbnb were in San Francisco. They were noticing that during conferences all the hotels were booked. So they literally inflated air mattresses in their home during a, um, it was one of the Democratic, Democratic, yeah, Democratic conferences that came in, and they put it out there, and people stayed in their home on the air mattresses, they gave them breakfast, and now you have Airbnb. That's a solid question. I do not know the answer to that, but all of those, like that would still, I would think that like if it's, that's a great question. She would be grandfathered, but I would think that we would need to explore that and call the city. I, I'm gonna talk to Will tomorrow. Will Miller is in charge of the short-term rental um, ordinance. Like he handles all the conditional use permits for the city. And I'll ask him that question tomorrow. Like, but if you're at the Travel L Park and you had a trailer, can I do that? You know? Yeah, let me know what you find there. North, right? Norfolk stance is no on, um, on, I don't know how broad it goes. I know for sure houseboats or boats. They'll, they'll say no. Cannot. Yeah, cannot. I don't know but how far why? they go with that. The, the stance that I heard, that we'd heard from the city, because we, we found out. Um, <laughs> It wasn't us, but we, we were in contact with somebody who uh, was renting out multiple houseboats on, on docks, and the city just looked at it as that's not a dwelling, a registered dwelling unit that they can tie it to. So at least the way that Norfolk has written the regs is that they're going to pull up a parcel ID on Norfolk Air, and they're going to say, okay, it's tied to that. that you, so you, in Norfolk, you either have to go through the registration process through their portal or through the conditional use permit, and that's based off of the number of units they have. You couldn't do either because there's no, no parcel ID. Yeah. So let's be clear that the motivation is revenue. <laughs> so if it can't be tied to a property and it can't be tracked, I mean, the motivation is revenue, right? Because we pay, uh, in the city of Virginia Beach, it is a 9% gross and $2 per day rented. So you have, you know, it's like a double tax. So if you have, you know, so you, you can do the math on that one. Um, Airbnb has been kind enough to finally give us the ability to collect that from the guests. So we're able to do that now. Thank you, sir. All right. Um, one other opportunity in the short-term rental market is, you know, I know a lot of people um, may not like the entry level, like I don't want to buy a property. That's okay. I mean, there's plenty of opportunities to either do rental arbitrage or co-hosting, right? And so you can make money doing either one of those. So rental arbitrage is where you go lease a space, lease a single family home, lease an apartment, and then like you're covering the lease and then you're subletting it as an Airbnb. Um, there have been several people that have done that. And then co-hosting is where you kind of manage. Matt does a lot of co-hosting or managing of the short-term rentals. And so there's, you know, and that, those fees can be pretty pricey. They're, they range anywhere from, you know, 20 to 45%. My, my brother-in-law, has a couple of properties in Gatlinburg, and they're managed by a local property management. They bought into that when they bought the property. Uh, so down here, it's Dolphin Run. Dolphin, okay, there's a couple of different hotel, like condominiums down at the oceanfront that also offer those services, and they tip, typically run like 45%. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. Yeah, but that's it. So you have to keep in mind, though, like, I know you guys are like, oh, property management is 10%, but we're looking at guest communications. Mm -hmm. you, it, you know, it's 24 hours a day, 365 a year. Like you are never off. And you're, you're you know, taking toilet paper 
and unclogging toilets and bringing a light bulb and showing somebody how to utilize a television set because they didn't read the instructions or can't interpret and don't know how to use a fire stick. So the level is significantly higher than a property manager who puts a tenant in a property and then, you know, they've got 12 months and whatever. So, I mean, there's also, there's a lot to that one too, but there's so much more communication that happens with Airbnb. Absolutely. And I think this is not the be all end all num number we charge is more like philosophically. So now tes Tesseract charges 16 and a half percent of, of net. So like after tax and everything. And I think our true cost somewhere probably gonna be way too much is like 12 and a half mm -hmm. at least. And so, you know, I've got 24 seven reservationists, literally 24 seven, 365. 24 uh, seven, you know, operations response. Um, so we right, right. staff that. So I mean, most it's true what my parents said, like nothing good happens after midnight. Um, so, you know, that, tw that midnight to 3 a.m., uh, you got to staff for it. Uh, you've got laundry, you know, we have our own laundry facility. We've got, we call them night runners and day runners, and cleaners and logistics associates to make sure that all those yeah. things happen. It's all of the difficult things of running a hotel just scatter it across a region. Yeah. So, and that's more of a scale issue than it is for me, right? Like I, uh, because I'm so small, we're able to be in there so frequently and my units are half a mile from my house. Uh, but I can't, I mean, I was just over there the other day. Like I was like, she was like, I can't work the TV. I'm like, is the fire stick still in there? She's like, no. I was like, I don't mean to be rude, but you know what a fire stick is? She's like, oh yeah, I have one at home. But I got there freaking fire stick is in there. I'm like, just unplug, plug it in. We were good to go. So there, there's just that, like, and then this is not directed to that particular guest, but you really have to make all your units idiot proof. Like you have to make them so dumbed down and simple so people can just walk in and enjoy that space or your phone's going to be ringing off the hook 24 seven because they can't operate the microwave or whatever. And it, it's like, that's why that, property management fee is so much higher. Um, all right, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Mine's always on a weekend, 1,000%. Yeah. Or a holiday. Yes, sir. Well, I'm obviously interested in that. <laughs> yeah. Do you I'm help? Sure. Do you help with the permit process? We have in the past. Um, we have in the past. It, it's, we, we can certainly chat. It, it's uh, it's a beast. Uh, it's probably the, the short answer. Happy to provide guidance around. I think eighty. We kind of eighty twenty it now, right? Like we used to walk people through the different steps of it. Um, it's so involved that it was taking yeah, I'm, a couple people on our team full yeah. time. Do you guys know if there's any attorneys that are doing that or anybody? Not that I'm aware of. In business doing that, helping people get I guarantee you, Matt is cheaper than an attorney. Yeah, but he's Matt not three hundred dollars an hour. I have to do that, but so much too. But you it's know, a, a lot. It's but a lot. it's still a per it's a per fee item. But an attorney, you're three hundred dollars oh, really? an hour. You guys do have a per fee on that? So we we've charged in the past. I I would I've. He's like, please it's, don't make me do it, this. I'm happy to happy to chat. There's a couple again to 8020. There's like a couple email addresses. I can help you, you guys with that. Yeah. 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 Happy to help. It's more like this. I'm happy to give away like all that stuff for free, and then the last 20 percent of it takes us like 100 plus hours to do, and you'll be able to get, you'll be able to get there with the right email address. Yeah. I'm happy to chat tonight on that. So let's talk about uh, short-term rental locations. Um, you don't have to do it here locally. They're actually fairly easy to manage uh, remotely. If you have a good team, you just need an excellent cleaner, a great handyman, handy person. You can manage the reservation side yourself if that's something that you choose. But as far as choosing the perfect location, and I want Matt to dive into this for a minute um, after I kind of go over some things because I feel like he really undersold himself on the, his introduction. So I need you to understand that this guy, okay, we won't talk about where he graduated from, but it's a prestigious institution. 
chose Norfolk specifically, then raised private money, then went and bought multi-units and turned them into Airbnb. So like wrap your head around that for a second. Here I'm just like, let me go get a townhouse. And this guy's like scaled that massively. So it, I find it fascinating he chose Norfolk. Like I can wrap my head around that. I'm a little mad at myself for like being last on that one. <laughs> I go like, oh, that was a good idea. I could have done that too. No, but it, you know, Norfolk is, was super undervalued. Um, but anyway, so when we start talking about short-term rentals, like there's no really wrong answer there. Like you have to find places that have high demand for whatever reason. Maybe it's a college town. Um, maybe they're, they're, you know, hospitals. Uh, Norfolk has super high demand for a variety of reasons. I also find it fascinating that you realize that guests don't know that this is Ocean View and not Virginia Beach, and this isn't the ocean, it's the bay, and that's the ocean. They still come here on vacation and don't know where they are and have an amazing time, and they're like paying the same rates that I'm getting down at Virginia Beach, and I'm like, what? <laughs> what is happening right now? But so be mindful of like, you want to be close to like sports arenas and things that are going to drive people. But also bear in mind that, that people are seeking a certain experience. I was talking to one of my, my husband's cousins. I consider him my cousin too. He's like, he lives up in the mountains. He's like, I'm going to put yurts on my, I'm like a thousand percent. You throw a yurt on that land and it's going to, because people want to have an experience. So that's really what the short-term rental market is about is providing an experience. All of my properties are beach themed because you're coming to the beach. You're usually coming from some place where you don't have a beach. So when you step into my spot, I want you to feel like you're on vacation. I want you to immerse yourself as though you're living that experience. And I want to make it warm and welcoming, beachy, and so that people really have fun with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think a couple things to add. So I think about it as a, as a funnel. And I totally agree with Carrie that just because you either live in Norfolk or Portsmouth or Virginia Beach, I think it's... You guys happen to live in a great, we all now live in a great area for it. But I think I would encourage everybody in this room to, because you can do this remotely, almost prove to yourself just through some quick analysis that this, this area makes sense, right? So I look at it at a really large funnel. Um, I agree with everything Carrie has on our list, so I'll just add a couple things. Mm -hmm. um, the first tier for me is the regulatory environment. I prefer to be in spots where I know the rules of the game versus hoping that the rules of the game get written in a way that is favorable for me. So if I'm looking nationally, I'm gonna pick a spot, so the first pass is, what cities have actually put in place some regulatory framework that I can understand? Uh, that's kind of number one. Uh, the asterisk there is, if there's talk, if, if you can even just look it up, like the stuff going on in Virginia Beach, if you yep. type in Virginia Beach short-term rentals, click on news, you'll see all the conversations that are yep. being had. You can kind of understand directionality, and let's say it's not Virginia Beach, let's say it's uh, Phoenix, Arizona. You can yep. call up what folks in Phoenix, Arizona, you know, like uh, real estate agents, folks maybe who are managers there, to try to get an inside track. Like you wanna find a carry in that spot where you can say, hey, I'm seeing that it looks like the regs are going this way. What's the inside scoop? Um, and they may give you some info, but definitely tread with caution there. And if so, I think I can turn you into a client, I will be more than happy to spend some time with you. Yeah. <laughs> so first bar would be reg environment. You want the rules of the game to be written. The second is a lot of the reason, so it might be kind of controversial. My take is that short-term rental market will kind of follow the maturity curve of hotels. So if I look at hotels 100 years ago, it was more of a mom and pop kind of industry. And over time, those mom and pops got bought by mid-sized players who ended up getting bought by the Marriott and Hyatt's of the world. And so the quality, the quality in some ways rose and declined. You're never gonna get the personal touch you get from one person. But so my theory is that it's gonna kind of follow some of that trajectory. It's certainly very popular, right? So you're gonna enter a town, even if it's early, you might be the only person you're being, being there, but if it's a good gig and you're making money, you know that people are gonna follow suit. So I say that to say that your revenue today, it might go up, but as it gets more popular, it can also go down because there's more people here. Um, hotels nationwide are something like 50, 55% occupied. So in, Internally, we use that number to say that anytime I'm buying something, I'm thinking the long game in 10 years. Mm -hmm. I might be getting 90, 95% occupancy today, but I'm thinking, what if this was a hotel room? And this space is so mature. And, and that's more unique, I think, to our case because I'm raising money that's going to be deployed and sit there for 10, 20, 30 years. Um, 
So the second one is you want to think about, okay, if nationally hotels are 50 to 55% occupied, there are certain regions, and this gets to the Norfolk thing, certain regions that are actually more occupied, and why? And one of the reasons why I love Norfolk and Virginia Beach and, and Portsmouth is that you, the summer, you've got tour, tourism. So I want to find a place that has tourism, whether it's summer or winter, and then I want some off-season reason for being. And so here we've got military, right? Mm -hmm. Military families coming in, we've got great hospitals, we've got universities, uh, no sports arenas, but there's a, a reason for people to travel in the off season. So that boosts us, I think, mm -hmm. both of our occupancies year round compared to other spots in the country. So if I were to add two, it's reg environment, and then is there something that's like counter seasonality? So you've got a boost in the summer, you're still gonna make most of your money in the summer. Then you're still gonna do pretty well yeah. in, in the off season, but you wanna have both. That's Gatlinburg is year round. Florida. Yeah year round, mm -hmm. like year round. No, there is no season, am I right? There's. So we, what you're really talking about a strategy yeah. to repeat what I just said. Um, we've been looking at short term rentals, gosh, Carrie and I talked about a couple years ago. Um, and. Part of the reason that we went to Kissimmee is it is a short-term rental HOA community. Right. All 192 pages of the HOA documents have in big, bold, 16 point across the top. You recognize you are in a short-term rental community. Um, so I think that strategy, absolutely. We also wanted full-time seasonality. Mm -hmm. We wanted, we are seven miles from Disney from yeah. where we're at. But even if you didn't have Disney, there's the golf courses, there's the, all of those sort mm -hmm. of things. So I think, I think you're absolutely right. Strategy has everything to yeah. do with it. Yeah. Everything. I think you can make or break if you don't have a good exit plan or a good totally. solid due diligence plan going in. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, I think it definitely makes or breaks what you're doing. Or in your case, your ability to shift like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah I, think, I think that's a good note, though. I mean, if, if you're in a just summer, you know, playing field and then something like COVID happens and there's no summer, mm -hmm. you just lost your revenue for the entire year. That's right. So having that balance, I'm sure, yeah. gives you a little yeah. bit more confidence, if nothing else. So, uh, especially like Nashville, mm -hmm. you know, people go all year round. Yeah. There's just like, Last time I checked, like nine different categories of travelers. Up to heat. And uh, you want to make sure you have a few of those in there so you can cover out for your whole year. Totally. Yeah. And even if one of those categories goes away, business travel last year. So I've been given notice. We gotta we gotta wrap it. So so I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about numbers. I have to move a little closer into this one because I can't see it. But as a so I have a little um, townhouse it's two bedrooms one bath it's roughly a thousand fourteen square feet it's located one mile from the oceanfront i use it as short-term rental it's always been a short-term rental uh, so i'm going to go through some numbers with you real quick as a short-term rental it generates thirty seven thousand almost thirty like almost thirty eight thousand dollars a year so it's roughly thirty one sixty six a month and after I do my mortgage, my electric, Wi-Fi, water bill, property tax, insurance, supplies, because I'm, so my properties, I provide paper products, toilet paper and paper towels, because there's nothing worse than showing up and having one roll of toilet paper. Are you kidding me right now? And, you know, like hand soap, dish soap, cleaning supplies. So that's included in that. And then I also, I have a cleaner. And then I have my city lodging taxes, right? So I'm paying 9% gross and then $2 per night rented. So my expenses are running me roughly $2,000 a month. Uh, my net income is $1,000, $1,024 a month. I'm grossing, my net on that property is right around twelve five, dollars right? So wrap your head around that. One little rental property, $12,500 net a year. If I were to use that as an annual rental, right, I'd be making like maybe 1400 bucks a month. Uh, by the time I do my property tax and insurance, those expenses are $1,335. My net is running about $65 a month for an annual income of about $780.
If I use it as a corporate rental, which I do in the winter time, I'm charging around $1,800, but keep in mind it's a furnished rental. I'm not providing supplies, but I am providing Wi-Fi and electric. I do not provide cable, because cable sucks. If you're not streaming off the internet, too bad, so sad. Um, <clears throat> so I still have to pay electric, I still have to pay Wi-Fi, I still have to pay water, property tax, and insurance. Those expenses are around 50, like $1,600 a month. I'm netting about two, a little over $200 a month, so that one equates to about $2,400. So, so somewhere in between my short term round, I'm grossing, my net gross is $12,000, $13,000 a year on one rental. Scale that. <laughs> yeah, and those numbers, numbers check out. And I usually strip out, you know, if we go down to the NOI, my general rule of thumb now that is industry's matured and guests also continue to yeah. demand our internal kind of mantras, comforts of home, quality of a hotel. So you're kind of having to do double duty there. He's also done multifamily though, mm -hmm. right? So he has one unit. I don't know how many Wi-Fis do you have to buy for one unit? Like if you have a 10 unit building, how many, uh, one yeah, Wi-Fi? We're doing mesh, mesh networks. Right, right. So you're buying, you're paying for paying one for network one yep. spread across 10 units. One mortgage spread across 10 units. So his numbers are gonna be significantly better than mine per unit, right? So he's probably making roughly the same income per single unit times 10 in one building. Yeah, in general, like my rule of thumb, if I'm looking at something without digging in is, okay, gross revenue, multiply that by 55%, and that's yeah. roughly gonna be your NOI on a short-term rental if you're providing a product that's gonna last and you have good reviews. So That's the, kind of rule of thumb, 50, 55? Yeah, and mine with my mortgage, I'm usually like 40, 40, 20. So 20% 20 in expensive, 40% 40, 40 in mortgages, and then 40% in net, net income. So imagine when all those are paid off. I'm literally like 20% expenses and then 80% net income. Probably. It's really good. Thereabouts. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's yeah. a skinny ship. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be fine with that clogged toilet. It'll be fine. We'll fix it tomorrow. <laughs> so, um, it has been always, you know, as always, it's a pleasure to come to Opportunity with Alex and Sean. Um, we've done a lot of things together, and I, I so greatly appreciate this crowd, and I appreciate the opportunity to just come and share with you guys our knowledge and our experiences. We're always here to help elevate people. That's kind of my life purpose. I can't, I can't speak for Matt. Matt's been an amazing resource to me since... Since I met him, I know I can pick the phone up and give him a shout. And he's always like, you know, I'm super intrigued and always impressed. Um, because, I, again, you know, circling back to the conversation, I'm one of those, like, I'm a cog in my own piece of machinery. And that's not a good thing. I'm not bragging about that. It's actually a limiting factor with great clarity. So I'm, I'm always impressed and intrigued when I pe meet people like Matt that can just scale these things and on such a high level. And... So thank thanks. you for showing up tonight. That. I appreciate yeah. you. And I think on, on our side, yes. Yeah, so thanks so much, guys, for, for having us. On a couple of resources that I wanted to kind of throw a plug out there for, um, we're working on kind of uh, the fully automated one will be here soon. But I'll say as a general offer to folks in the crowd, if you are uh, under contract and earnestly pursuing closing on, on a, any unit in, uh, kind of in the region, We've got a website that you can plug in the address um, and start answering different questions about the, you know, how many bedrooms is it, how many parking spaces. We'll kind of go all the way through. Um, we ingest all that information, and then within like 24 hours, we'll send you a full uh, financial analysis of that property, as well as like a reg analysis. And it's one of those, you know, caveat emptor sort of deals where, you know, it's you might look at it and say, whoa, you get the operating expenses that you guys showed on that were really, really, really heavy. I lean towards every time you buy something, you need to make the case against it, right? Like there's a million reasons why it could work. Figure out the reasons why it's not going to work. So we're going to be pretty realistic. Um, so uh, there's a link to that. Yeah. So, yeah. So Sorry, if you can't that, kill the deal, it's a deal. And then for Norfolk, we've got, a, we've got a website guide that will kind of distill down this is, again, caveat emptor. Uh, this is our best understanding. There's a Notion page that we made. You can kind of click through and make some more sense of Norfolk short-term rental regulations and some general best practices. Sure. They kind of go between, going between the lines. What does it mean to go to a syndicate? Uh, what sort of things should you be doing 
to go above and beyond to make sure that you're giving your conditional use permit the best shot possible. Uh, so we've got a, now an online guide for that. Uh, I think the link will go out to everybody. That's awesome. Okay. Guys, yeah, just so y'all know, that's like insanely helpful stuff. If you're looking in this realm at all, it's it's a very complicated world of rules and regs. Now you can go and you can run a short-term rental and um, you can make money doing it. But if you wanna do it correctly and know that you can do it, the thing that um, Matt and his company Tesseract have done is they have, they basically had investors come in and trust them with their money. And so you have to deliver. And so you have to know what you can guarantee. And um, that, that's awesome, man. I think that'll be extremely helpful to a lot of people. So we'll definitely share that on the website. Guys, yeah. thank you so much for, for sharing all that Thanks, you have. Thanks, oh, Karen. Pleasure. Good thank you. Good to see you, too. Okay. So for everyone here and watching online, we're going to do a short Q&A, about 15 minutes. Last call, I don't know for sure, but it's probably 8.30. So if you want a drink, um, now might be the time. And then from 8.30 to 9, we'll do some networking so that you guys can talk to Matt and Carrie and Sean and Alex personally. Um, so Sean and Alex are going to go around with the mics. Does anyone have questions? Yeah, real quick, uh, just wanted to know if you guys have seen any correlation um, between over-improving properties with regards to your return. Um, so, I mean, we're talking putting million-dollar finishes in a $200,000 home, you know, a three-bedroom. Is that going to affect your, you know, NOI in the, end, in the end game? Or are you finding that things like your, the price that you set it at, the condition of the home, and the amenities that you include are more dictating your NOI in the end. That's a, a great question. So I think there's a couple components, and I, I'd be super interested as well what Carrie has to say here. I think a lot of the reason, so why does Airbnb exist? Why do people use it? One of the reasons, I think, is still that they're getting, there's a value play here. Um, and so imagine if you're traveling with your family or anybody and you're gonna book two hotel rooms, or you could get a two bedroom apartment, right? With a kitchen that I can cook. And I can stretch out. Exactly. And like, I'm celiac, and, and I so I have kids. to go to a place I've got to cook my food. So I think what you can look at on one side is, I, locality aside, I think there's some places, to answer your question, that are very, very, very nice, right? Like, uh, that you, it's a default that you have to do what you're talking about, right? You don't want to be in Alice Beach, in Florida, I don't think you could do this, but like, have a, a jankety place in Alice Beach, Florida, where everything's a million dollars. Like, kind of the market will set it. But I think your question's more of, can you generate higher returns by making this incredible place? I think there's some bumping that you can do, right? Like you may be the first place that people pick, but I think you can't totally overcome the value play. And so that um, we ha I have a way, I have thought through like kind of like reverse engineering of like why are the rates the way that they are? And it seems like the biggest factor is what are hotel rates in your given region? And you're gonna kind of track to some percentage mm -hmm. lower than that. So go to Virginia Beach in the summer, or you're gonna pay like 300, 400 a night for yep. whatever hotel you can get. So that's yep. 800 for two bedrooms. <clears throat> you're not gonna get 800 a night, I don't know if you're getting. Oh no. Uh, yeah, you're not, not gonna get not. 800 no. a night for a two bedroom, even if it's you know the Taj Mahal in, uh, in Virginia Beach. So I think the biggest factor is the number of bedrooms, uh, number of bedrooms and the bathrooms, and then proximity to where people wanna be. So you can definitely over, over improve Yep. And, uh, and it's still early, even though Airbnb is really prolific, it's early enough days, the market's early enough that you can get away on the lower side of it in some cases. You may just not have as much longevity because of the rates. You still have to be competitive, though, because it, it is now becoming a pretty competitive arena. So if you don't have the amenities and reviews to match because the reviews are your driving force behind your business, so, you know, Matt has a different, like he has a set, like here's how we decorate. And so he has this corporate-minded decoration. Like, he can, to the penny, tell you what he's putting in his... I'm very fluid on that. I'm like, oh, this will look cute right here. So I, I'm, I'm more into developing an experience. I'm not going to outperform him necessarily, but my reviews, my reviews really do speak to the level that we've put into that property, and that's the driving force. So to your point, can I over-improve? thousand percent I can over improve is that going to increase my return on investment not necessarily it is it is what matters cleanliness comfortable beds 
proximity. Mm -hmm. You know, th those are the things that, in acute space, it needs to be clean first, it needs to be acute space second, like people need to be attracted to that, like you have to add those little features that matter. Like I said, people that are doing Airbnb not only are looking for a space to spread out, but they're also looking for a space where they can feel it's an emotional experience for them, and that matters. You want to leave them feeling something. It can't all be just, you know, so yeah. Uh, did that answer your question? I think you just kind of have to shop that one around. Yeah. That one's that one vacillates pretty, you know. So I had my rates went up on the last one because it, you know, it's just. I'm sure it's kind of like after Sandy hit, my personal home is less than half a mile from the oceanfront, and after Sandy hit, my traveler's insurance went from twelve hundred to four thousand dollars a year. It's like any kind of insurance. You're going to need to shop that way. I don't have a preference. I'm just like, okay, who do we have right now? And to that point, Virginia Beach is requiring that you the also was, who carry. Do you like for your um, short-term landlord insurance. Yeah, I, it's just you got to shop it. Uh, we use Prosper. I think. Yeah, I think yeah. the I, framework here is most hosts don't know that they need that their insurance uh, policy needs to be applicable Specific. for less than thirty days. Um, so your insurance rates are going to be way higher than a traditional. Yeah. So I think that's first bar of like if you know that you need short-term rental insurance. For your hazard and liability, great. Um, we use Prosper. I think there's another, some other cool products that are coming out now that allow the guests to pay um, a certain number of like dollars per insurance. night, like a renter's insurance. Yeah. Um, there's a couple products. I can send an email with like a link to those that are pretty great. I'll there's send you Andy's information too because I have a, a good broker that Sean turned me on to that has been able to shop those rates. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, Prosper is awesome. They do all yeah. different kinds of stuff. They're great. And they're very focused in this area, too, so they come up with a lot of creative stuff mm -hmm. in this area. Yeah, they're local to this area, but to be, you know, to drive that point home, short-term rental insurance is different than any other insurance. It is not landlord and landlord policy. It is not a homeowner's policy. It is short-term rental. Mm -hmm. It makes sure if you're doing short-term rentals that you have addressed that because something bad could happen. And your insurance uh, policy not cover it. So, mm -hmm. just, yeah, I'm just I gonna throw that out there. Yeah, to be totally morbid, I was thinking in terms of like somebody die on the property. Um, the terrible thing, like you got to protect yourself from that stuff, right? And uh, make sure your your gaps are covered. Airbnb is consider their insurance like non-existent. Uh, right, I know they promise that million dollar lot, but yeah, it's yeah, whatever. Do you have a place that you can say, you know, I want beachy look where you can, or do you just go shopping on Amazon trying to find beachy type stuff? Such a chick question. <laughs> Home goods is really good. Home goods is amazing. Here, I wholly agree with that. But I, I also like to, because I find that your guests as a, are as hard on your furniture and stuff as any teenage boy will be. So I typically go and get furniture that has been re refinished by, you know, because you can get like Thomasville that's fully outdated, but it's a whole wood and you could not go into a furniture store and buy that for less than a thousand bucks. So I'll find somebody that has refinished that prop, you know, to cute colors and blah, blah, blah. And I'll go buy that for 200 bucks, throw it in the property. So, and then to his point, so, I mean, solidly around here, but you know, Coastal decor is not hard to find, especially in this area. But I, I would say they're in Disney. You know, they're they got Disney stuff in their their property. I, you know, Amazon's a great location. Wayfair, Wayfair. Yep. Home Goods, wherever you're at. Yeah, I got a few online questions. Um, some of them it looks like you might have already gone over. If buying a short-term rental in Norfolk or Virginia Beach, how much would you spend per house or per unit? To I'm sorry to do what? If you were buying a short-term rental in, buying. yeah, in Norfolk or Virginia Beach, how much would you spend per house or per unit? I guess that depends on what my anticipated return on investment is. Okay. <laughs> um, do you avoid buying condos? 
So, so yeah, a couple yeah. things there. So no, a Norfolk more PSA is that Norfolk, you cannot have even a single short-term rental in a building with more than nine units. So that one is kind of confusing the way they wrote it. We get that a lot of, okay, the, if the building has 100 units and it's a condo or whatever it is, can I have one, can I have nine? Does that mean like nine? The way that it's, at least as we've been working through, is that no, if there's even 10 units in that parcel, that parcel ID, you can have exactly zero uh, short-term rentals there. Um, so that's even aside from condos. A lot of times condo associations, unlike the one in Kissimmee, uh, will, will ban, you know, they'll, they'll write mm -hmm. in that you can't do less than 30 days. There is one kind of loop that you can technically buy a con only if it is your primary residence in Norfolk, you can home share a condo. Um, but I would, banks don't love condos. I think, so. so to reiterate, condominiums and POAs, HOAs, property owners associations, homeowner associations, and condo associations are all governed by their documents. Their documents will define whether or not they allow short-term rentals. The caveat to that entire conversation is that Virginia Beach doesn't care if the condo association allows for short-term rentals. They've trumped it with their ordinance. So even if the condo association allows and stipulates for, you still have to go through the conditional use permit. Now, I personally am not a huge fan of condos in our particular area because they very rarely appreciate at the same level as, as single-family homes. And condo fees never go down. They only go up. It's not the president. They usually have to have a quorum, yeah. right? Term, like it, it, takes, it takes a significant number of people. But I will tell you, sorry for any Karens in the room, but the Karens of the world will unite in a condo association to dis dis them. I mean, it's just like, I don't like that level of regulation. I prefer simple fee ownership so that I'm very clear on what that looks like because condos can change special assessments, blah, blah, blah. It's very hard to gauge what your long-term costs are going to be on a condo because maybe they don't have enough in reserves. Maybe they didn't, you know, they're not ready for their siding to be changed or their roofs to be switched out. So I, that's, that's my, I'm not a, not a fan. I got two more. Um, are backyards important? Absolutely. Okay. Backyard. Well, it's a part of the experience. So that so circles backyards. back around to having an experience. Do people use backyards? Maybe, maybe not. But should you set the backyard up so that it's clean and functional and has a grill? Thousand percent. Okay. And then bunk beds, yay yeah or nay? They're really hard to make. <laughs> so, yeah, I, we've got bunk beds in some of ours. I think the maybe a question behind the question is, you, you still have to meet the, uh, occupancy, the occupancy regulation limits, yep. right? So it's going to be per bedroom. So I think in some cases it can work. Because of a bunk bed. Did I mention earlier you have to make this like idiot proof? Did I say that already? Yeah. I'm sorry, did I say idiot? You have to simplify everything because you have to assume worst case scenario on every capacity. They're gonna burn the house down, they're gonna fall off the bunk bed. So you always want to decrease the liability. I don't offer any fire pits at my house. Did you have a fire pit? <laughs> Hell no, I have no fire pit. <laughs> they're gonna burn down the neighborhood. No, I do not have a fire pit. So Keep those things in mind. Simple, simple is better. Limit liability in every regard. You got something, Derek? Guys, this will be the last question. Finish up, okay? Might be a little funny question, but can you turn a backyard into parking spots, possibly? So, you, you uh, short answer is you can't. Um, so, it, uh, I'll speak just again for Norfolk. Um, Norfolk, whatever they tell you, the number of, of parking spaces that you need. If you want to turn your backyard into it, you have to go through a site plan review to get it approved, and even the type of paving and the width and depth and all of that. So it's not like you can say, oh, hey, park in our backyard. So funny you ask that question, right? So I'm going to take you through a little scenario that happened to a buddy of mine. Uh, he purchased a home in Chatelon specifically for the purposes of turning it into a short-term rental. 
to follow all of the regulations, which was in Virginia Beach, it is you have to have one nine by 18 parking space per bedroom in the property. So, concreted the front yard, turned the whole front, most of the front yard, like 60% of the front yard then became a concrete jungle, right? And it was a non-pervious, um, so <laughs> what's fascinating is like there was never, uh, all the regulation said was one per bedroom, it's met. Goes into city council, this guy's an attorney by the way, goes into city council, everything's met, and they, they decline him. They, they deny his conditional use permit because they're like, you can't do that. Where in the regulation does it say I can't do that? It doesn't. So he appealed that and was granted his conditional use permit, and then I turned around and sold his house. But at the end of the day, now the regulation, the change in regulations that's happening is if, if you have to increase your parking, off-street parking, it has to be a non-pervious no, it has to be a pervious. Uh, yeah, like yep. so, like it yep. has to be, like it has to be gra In other words, it cannot shed water. It cannot be concrete. It has to be gravel or pavers or something that will absorb water. So, can you turn your backyard into parking? To his point, Norfolk, like that requires that a site plan. Norfolk, Matt? Virginia Beach, what you can that? do that, but it has to be a. Isn't that opposite in Norfolk? Impervious. Don't they have to be concrete? It depends. <laughs> Heavily depends. Like we've even seen like be engineered, it's not just gravel, it needs to be engineered gravel. So I, I think probably Isn't one, one engineered high level gravel? engineered gravel. So one <laughs> high level kind of comment Whatever that, that means. I've seen. So here's here's a pattern that I've seen happen a lot. So if you buy a property that's a rental, and this occurs all over the place, right? Like just because it was operating a certain way, common things are okay, I bought this triplex. As soon as you go through conditional use permit, it basically, in my opinion, opens the property up for reassessing how many units are there, That's when correct. are they approved, how many parking spaces. So the argument, you know, I think it falls on deaf, deaf ears with the city, and it really just requires, like, if you are an attorney like your friend, maybe yeah. you can have some success, is that you really have to do your diligence before you buy it. Like, I see this a lot in Chicks Beach, that there's triplexes, really single-family homes, and they've been operated that way for a long time, and, oh, just because it was grandfathered in 1975, you're basically reopening, you're pulling back Correct. the curtains and letting the city peek in, um, and they're going to go by the letter of the law. So that's a, uh, really, really yep. and, be and scary. And in our region, conditional use permits will follow the property as long as it is maintained as a short-term rental. Like if you have a, if I were to sell 941 Maryland and it's been utilized as a short-term rental, it has a conditional use permit and I wanted to sell it with that conditional use permit, it can convey with the property as long as it has continued to be used and hasn't been vacant for two years, I think is, is what their current ordinance is, what they're requiring. So if you have a Norfolk property, same thing. If it's been utilized as a conditional use permit, then that will convey with the property as long as you retain similar use of the property. My mic was off, so, yeah. so all the cities have, uh, so basically the process is that you're, when you're applying for a conditional use permit process, it's gonna be heard by city, uh, the city planning commission. Um, Virginia Beach and Norfolk publish yep. when those meetings are happening and they publish the agenda ahead of time. So you can go retrospectively and look at all the conditional use permits that have, have been in either city um, and the results of those. Um, and I believe they're, are they recorded in Virginia Beach? They are Beach? recorded in Virginia Beach, So you can go back Beach, and watch, yeah. you know, three and a half hours videos. Um, but yeah, so those are published. Uh, if you're within a radius of a property that is going to have a conditional use permit going up for hearing, you'll get a notice from the city. But if you just want to speak broadly, uh, pro short-term rentals, you can look up um, on both of the websites. And uh, Virginia Beach Zoom still? Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, whether they're in person, they do still Zoom though. So Virginia Beach is getting ready to do their final vote on July 6th. Um, That'll, and if you want to know what the current ordinance is and what the proposed changes are, I will give Sean and I'll give Sean and Alex the link, and then they'll publish it on your page so that you guys have access to that, and it'll give you all the background of exactly what the ordinances are and 
what you can anticipate the changes. So I'll give you the abbreviated version is if it's not in what's considered an overlay district, which means if it's not in this region or this region, it's not gonna happen. Sandbridge, by the way, is its own special district and can do whatever. Guys, we got like a million questions we could ask. Yeah. But, um, yeah. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna finish it out and say thank you for you guys helping coming here. Appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks Karen. For everybody that's here, um, if you would check us out. If you don't already follow us on the opportunity page, give us a like and something about tonight's meeting. Whether it was helpful, whether it was nothing, whether it was worth it. Like, does everybody here think this is worth their time tonight? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Awesome. Um, otherwise, guys, hang out, network, talk, um, and meet these guys and ask questions, right? Um, we're here. I think they shut down at 9 o'clock, so I'm pretty sure we got like 30 minutes before we got to start like wrapping it up. And one more thing. I want to thank, if you guys don't already know, we've got Ashley, Luna, Vanessa, and Cam that help us do all this. So please and give them a round of applause, and uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, thanks y'all for coming out tonight. This is awesome.